I'm enjoying this whole having communion off. And, oh, man, i got to tell you, though, I didn't really take communion off that time because I'm sitting there at the steps, and I'm kind of starting to go through my message. And then my, my brother Rod starts talking. And I'm going to tell you, I, he, he's been my, my close confidant for several years now. They got my go-to guy, and then I've got some a lot of other close friends here and stuff. But Rod's Rod's been like you know the guy that's been there for me for several years, the last well wow decade, geez. And uh, and to listen to him sharing stuff, I just kind of got chills. I'm sorry, I loved it. Thank you, Rod. That was amazing. The name of the message today is uh, imitation, and and it's kind of. Uh, my son Ryan came out this morning, and we were sitting there on the couch, and he said, what's the name of your message today, Dad? And I said, imitation. And he said, well, you should do pretty well with that, because you imitate a preacher every day. <laughs> but you know what I love? I love when we're, uh, when, 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 I watch comedians. My favorite kind of comedians are the ones that imitate people. You know, because especially if you know who they're imitating. And you're like, wow, that's that's pretty good. And so I have this, this internal respect for people who can imitate other people because I'm not good at it. <laughs> My friends will, we can get an email out of you guys, that's okay. I'm not very good at it, but I'm, what I'm very fortunate about is I've got some friends that happen to be here right now that are actually pretty good at it. So what I want to do is just kind of uh, spotlight some, some talent that we have in the and how many of you guys have seen the Shawshank Redemption with Morgan Freeman? Okay. My friend, and a new friend, would say, this is going to be the longest sermon of my life. <laughs> <coughs> how many of you guys have seen Ace Ventura? <laughs> well, we don't have very many Ace Ventura people here. Oh, we're going to like to have new ones for sure anyway. Do you need this? <laughs> Let's do everything you want to do. <laughs> Ryan does a pretty good Dr. Phil. <laughs> but after his comment this morning, we're not going to let him do it. <laughs> <laughs> not fair. I uh, know, I know. What we do a lot of times in our lives is we, we tend to imitate things that we like. And and. It, and when we see successful people, we want to imitate what they do to become successful. When we see, sometimes we realize what we're seeing in people and we say, that's what I don't want to do. And we go the opposite direction. But a lot of times in our faith as well, we see people that we, we may look up to or maybe a, a spiritual mentor. And we tend to imitate their behavior. And sometimes that takes us to different paths. Sometimes that takes us down a road where people will not understand what we're doing because they're not used to, and you ask them, why are we doing that? And it reminds me of the, the story where the man married this young gal, and they were, she was cooking a roast, and she cuts the end of the roast off and sticks it in the pan and sticks it in the oven. And he says, oh, honey, why do you cut the end of the roast off? And she goes, well, my mom always did it, so I do it too. So a few weeks later, they were visiting their mom, her mom, and the, the young husband asked the mom, uh, Mom, why, why do you cut the end of the roast off when you go to cook it? And she goes, you know, I just do it because my mom did it. Okay. So fast forward to Christmas time, they're all gathering around, and, and the old grandma was there. And they wanted to ask her, they're trying to figure this out now, it's become the family quest. And so they, they said, Grandma, why did you always cut the end of the roast off? She said, well, it was because the pan I had was too short and the roast wouldn't fit in. Oh. Sometimes we imitate people we don't even know why. We don't even ask why. We just see something and we say, oh, I guess that's how you do it. In our faith, we do that a lot of times. We see a spiritual mentor or we see uh, uh, somebody that you, we consider to be a godly person and we say, you know, I'm just going to imitate them because they seem to know what they're doing. With never stopping to ask the question, do you know why they're doing that? I, I love, when I was a kid, and I'm going to tell you how I kind of cut my teeth in Christianity. When I was a kid, the fellow that was the minister at my church in Kinmundi, Illinois, was Dale Hunt. And I love one of the, two of the things that Dale said to me that stuck with me until I'm my age now. And you'll hear me say this occasionally, be about the Father's business. 
He always used to say that, and I love that phrase, and I still use that. But the other thing he used to say was when he'd be preaching, he would say, don't take my word for it. Get in the scripture, look it up for yourself, make sure that what I'm saying has foundation in scripture. So I'm thinking to myself, what does the scripture say about us imitating people? Not you guys, that's just for fun. I'm talking about imitating people with our faith. And we go to Philippians chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, it'll be the very first verse in chapter 2. Philippians. Paul says this. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. So now I'm thinking, okay, now we've got the exact person we are supposed to be imitating, right? We got, we got that part figured out. Now, now we just got to figure out how do we imitate Jesus? I said this to Tad a couple of weeks ago. He immediately started growing out a beard. And, and he, he, he started shopping for Roman sandals. I'm like, no, no, Tad, that's not, that's not what I'm trying to say. No, that didn't really happen. I love it. No, it's, it's about trying to figure out what Jesus was like. And so I'm going to flip backwards. I'm just going to read something to you really quick out of Galatians. And if you've read through Galatians 5, I just absolutely, if you've got your Bible, I encourage you to mark Galatians 5 starting with, Verse 19. Because this gives you the fruits. And you know, it says, in, in, the, in the scripture it says, we will be known by our fruit. We will be known by how we are. People will know us. You can profess to be a Christian. We can say that we go to church every Sunday. We can say we're strong in our faith. But if the fruits that we bear are those that I'm getting ready to read to you, guess what? We need to take a look in the mirror and realize we're not quite there. <clears throat> Galatians 5.19 says, The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery. Idolatry and witchcraft. Hatred. Okay, those first few were pretty easy to stay away from for the most part. But here we go. Hatred. Discord. Jealousy. Fits of rage. Selfish ambition. Dissensions. Factions. And envy. Drunkenness. Orgies. And the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. These are the fruits of selfish nature, aren't they? These are, these are the fruits that happen. This is what we show when we stop focusing on Jesus and just think about our own, what we want. But when we turn that around and we say, you know what, I don't want to think like me anymore because I don't trust my own thoughts. Christ Jesus, I want to think like you. I want to imitate you. Then all of a sudden, what are the fruits of thinking like Jesus? The next verse is, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Which list do you want to be a part of? That's not a real tough, tough question for me, I want to be honest with you. It's tougher to live it than it is to say it. So what do we need to do to get motivated? That's the job of this message today. Now that we've established the fact of what we want to be, who we want to be, who we want to imitate, how do we do it? How do we do it? The first thing we want to understand is when we imitate Jesus, we definitely want to imitate his gentleness. His gentleness. Remember the lady who got caught in adultery and was brought before Jesus? His culture said this woman was supposed to be put to death by stoning and this man, this man says, you who are without sin, you throw the first stone. And then when all, everyone left because nobody was sinless, instead of him, the, the, the savior of the universe, coming before her and giving her any kind of harshness or calling her out for what she'd done, all he said was, where are your accusers? And she said, they're gone. I'm paraphrasing. And he said, then I don't accuse you either. 
And then he follows it up with the most beautiful words. Go and sin no more. When he wanted to heal somebody, very often he didn't just put their hand on them and do this, this you know, faith healing thing. He would say, your sins are forgiven. You are healed. I want to go, in, in, in my perfect world, <laughs> I want to go to everyone that I have hurt and be able to say, I'm sorry, and then say to me, your sins are forgiven. Just be healed like it never happened. Because the hurt that you did to me is gone. Wouldn't that be amazing? If everyone I hurt, I could just say, I'm sorry, and it would be gone? Wouldn't it be great if I could just, every time somebody was upset with me, I could say, please forgive me, and they would, and it would be gone? Wouldn't it be great if every mistake I ever made could be wiped out? I thank Jesus that in His eyes it is. Amen. Unfortunately, in all the people in my life that I've hurt, it kind of carries on. I have to deal with the fallout of the people that I've hurt. And I want, I want the gentleness to be what I am. I want to be love, what projects out of me. And I can't do that when I'm busy focused on myself. And I think to myself, how do, how do we get, in this world, there's so many people that are so focused on themselves, and it's getting worse. It's getting worse because technology is getting to a place where communication isn't that important anymore face-to-face. -face. We don't learn how to talk to each other. How many, how many relationships have broken up by text? I've never seen my phone cry. I've cried on it a few times. <laughs> but I've never, when, when someone's saying something to me that's hurtful by a text, I can't see their emotion. We're losing that ability to, to, to communicate with each other. And because of that, we're becoming kind of self-centered. This is the, the, the thing I saw on Facebook this morning. is uh, When scientists finally discover the center of the universe, there are going to be some people surprised that it's not them. <laughs> you know... I, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. We, we like to blame people for being self-centered, for being arrogant, and all that. But I, I, you know what? I really don't think there's that many people that that's really what motivates them. I don't think. I think there's very few people who are really self-centered, arrogant, and think the world really revolves around them. But I do think there's a lot of people that are scared. I think there's a lot of people that are insecure. I think there's a lot of people who are looking to other people to try to build them up so they feel okay about themselves. And it comes across that. We hurt people unintentionally because we're trying to protect ourselves. We get upset with people that we love because there's something wrong in us and we're just afraid to say, I'm hurting. I don't have to be strong today. Can you be strong for me today? And maybe they can and maybe they can't. How many of you guys read my Facebook post this past week about uh, an off-the-rack world? Did any of you guys happen to see that? Got 138 likes. I was just, it was like 1 in the morning, and I was just kind of had a thought, and I just punched it out, and, and just a bunch of people just really, and I'm like, wow, thank you, Lord. But uh, the, the point that, that I was trying to make with that was we have a desire of things that we want, expectations that we want people to meet in our lives, in our friendships, you know, if a, if a friend doesn't do, if a friend isn't as good a friend as we think they should be to us, they tend, we tend not to like them anymore. A family member, a family member uh, upsets us for whatever reason instead of just saying, you know, I accept you as you are and, and please accept me as I am. We want to change them. We want to change their attitudes, their opinions. We want them to be somebody different, somebody that God didn't create them to be. In our relationships. We're so worried about finding the right person, we're not even concerned about being the right person. we got to get focused off of other people making us fulfilled. Jesus did not have people in his world that he looked to to make him feel special, or to make him feel confident, or to make him feel like he had something to say, or that he should be listened to, or that he was wise. He got all that from the Lord. And so can we. 
so can we. Make me lonely so I can be yours till I want no one more than you, Lord. I want him to be the focus of everything I am, everything that I do. I don't want anything to pass through my life without it. Going through the Jesus filter first. And I am failing because I'm human and I'm sinful and I'm sorry, so are you. We can't keep approaching life with this self-centered, I'm scared, fix me attitude. We've got to approach this world, this life with, I'm lonely, I'm scared, I'm hurting, but God, you are my strength. Yes. And that's where I find peace. That's where I find encouragement. That's where I have the strength to go on. Amen. I don't know what season God is taking you into right now. You might be in a change of season. But if you are, I invite you just to relax and let him have it. Let him realize. I hope he's on some medication today, guys. Medication is it to me. We only have two choices in life. When it comes down to it. Serve and please ourselves. Or serve and please God. That's where we want to go, isn't it? But how come it is we can go to a church service, we can listen to an inspiring word, we can sing songs about praising God and then go out and be so focused on serving ourselves by hurting other people, by not forgiving other people. The things we do that are not focused on all those fruits of the Spirit that I just said. Because we're looking for self-worth from other people. We don't have to. All the self-worth we need, we can find in Christ. Amen. And when we, when we find that, when we find that, it's at that time He can use us to our greatest potential. The more we give up what's going on inside of us that we're trying to protect, the more we give it to Him, the more He allows us to give it away. He will let your weakness become your strength. He will take you out of the muck and mire and put your feet on a firm foundation. And at that point, you can become everything that He created you to be. But we don't do that. We cover it up. We get selfish. We get emotional. When somebody hurts our feelings or when somebody doesn't do exactly the way we want them to do, we get upset with them. Here's my philosophy, and that's what I was trying to point out in that Facebook post. You know, you can walk into a clothing store, and if it's a nice clothing store, you can have them tailor you a perfect suit. And you get, it's fit just for you. But the world doesn't work that way. It is an off-the-rack world. The people we encounter, we are not in charge of them. We are only in charge of us. When it comes to our children, our friends, our parents, our relationships, our friendships, let's stop trying to get people to be what we expect them to be and just be the best to them we can be and love them for who they are. We are all the product of our pasts and our genetics, who we are as people and the things we've been through. And I can't be the friend to you that I would love to be. I would love to be the friend to each and every one of you guys that would just never do anything wrong. Everything you expect me and want me to do, I do it exactly as you would expect and want me to do it. I would love to be that friend to every one of you guys. I will not be that friend to any one of you guys because I am the product of all of my pain, all of my past, and the kind of person that I am. We are going to not be able to, I, I would love to be the perfect minister to everyone in this church. And, here's, and I would love for all of my friends to be the perfect church people for me. I would love that. I'm thinking to myself, i got a ton of friends. i got a ton of friends. And if all of my friends were the kind of friends I really wanted them to be at 4 o'clock on Sunday afternoon, it didn't matter what they were doing. They dropped everything and be right here because they want to support me because I worked hard to put a sermon together. <laughs> for those of you guys who aren't here today... And I look around and there's a lot of my friends here, but there's a lot of you missing. 
We're supposed to love you with the love of Jesus. If there is an imitation that we need to be really, really good at, if there's an imitation that we need to work at every hour of every day of our lives, it's imitating Jesus. Because that's where we find all that peace, all the things, the fruits of the Spirit. I want people to make that list of the, that I read of the fruits of the Spirit, the love, peace, joy, self-control. I want, I want somebody to read that at my funeral and say, yeah, that was kind of him. <laughs> I don't expect to get it all perfect. I know I won't. But I would love, I would love for, for people to think of me with those words and not the words of, wow, this guy's really self-centered. This guy's arrogant. This guy is this and that. All the things of the fruits of the evil. The only way I can do that is by every day, every minute of every day, every decision I make, being centered around, is this what Jesus would do? Because that's who I want to imitate. That would be great. That would be great. As a church, I commit to you that we should focus from this moment on, this moment for the rest of our lives. From now on, I want to imitate Jesus. Not just by showing up and being churchy. Not just by saying I'm a Christian, but every decision we make. Every time somebody does something we don't quite agree with or upsets us a little bit, how would Jesus, what would he say to them right now? What about the loved one that broke your heart? What would I say to them right now? What about that family member that just drives you nuts? What would Jesus say to them right now? I promise you it probably wouldn't be the last thing that you just said to them. <laughs> Let's be imitators of the greatest one of all, Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, I'm just I'm thankful for your love. I'm thankful for your message. God, it is my prayer today that we as a church would be committed to serving you by imitating your son, by understanding that love and understanding and accepting people as they are and loving them as they are is exactly what you call us to be and call us to do. So God, it is my prayer that this message doesn't fall on deaf ears today, that this message is motivating to all those listening to make changes within our lives, to be better at imitating you, the greatest of all. Love you, Jesus, through your name.